Welcome all. We are doing our uh, Wednesday sort of debrief in the course and sort of picking up a few odds and ends that we may have encountered in the discussion forums or that we may have had some uh, reflections on from people who've been involved in, with working through the, the course material and so on. So why don't we just do a quick round the horn with people who are uh, teaching the course. So we'll go Tanya, Justin, Nagan, Matt. Um, start with you, Tanya. What's going on? What have you noticed about course or just life in general over the last little while? Oh, I'm already unmuted because you wanted me to unmute myself. Sorry, I was just tweeting out um, a link and I tweeted out the link to this. Hopefully it doesn't lead to bad consequences to the um, Twitter community. Um, things that I have noticed, I think that as we've talked about previously, people are trying to replicate the face to face and what we're seeing in the last week already is what those of us who are experienced teaching online is that's a big challenge in a couple of ways. So there have been people who have talked about in the discussion forums and I've seen in social media and Twitter in particular talking about the fact that they don't have enough time to cover content. Students are exhausted and disengaged if they're just talking for 50 minutes um, in a Zoom session. I know that today, um, previously we've seen some challenges with Zoom and with Microsoft Teams or other software and falling off. So that's not necessarily reliable. Today I know in Wisconsin, we found out that our cable provider majority of Wisconsin, for some reason, we only have like one person that gives electricity and <laughs> one person for cable. Um, but the main cable provider, we've had lots of dropping of, um, of VPN um, networking for work stuff, but also with lots of the synchronous. And so I was tweeting earlier is that, you know, we've talked about different opportunities and replicating face to face and I'm you know, other than replicating face to face, which I'm sure some of you will talk about. But I think really we need to think about the risk of synchronous live technology and the lack of reliability. So when we do Zoom sessions like this, for example, last week, there could be the potential that it fails for one reason or another, it just doesn't work out. And you have to um, either A, immediately not do Zoom sessions and plan for a different way or an alternative way to deliver your content. Um, and also you need to have a plan B. So when this doesn't work out, is this information getting delivered to your students in a different form? And so as I talked about in the beginning um, in the introductory Zoom sessions that maybe um, recorded lecture or live lectures for 50 minutes are not the way to go and maybe start thinking about some other ways to deliver content. And so you guys can chime in whenever, but. <laughs> So um, that's the, the main thing is replicating the face-to-face -face in live 50-minute sessions is probably not the way to go. And people are reporting that it's not working out. Anybody absolutely. else hearing anything to the like of that? Yeah, absolutely. I've had a number of uh, faculty, I know I've heard it in my institution that have struggled. They've had the conferences drop, error codes, and ability to share things. A lot of it's probably just related to the load on the system. Um, that's a that's a huge part of it right there. Um, I think that it's 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 easy to move stuff. You know, you could just just try to think of it that way. Like I'm doing it this way, now I'm moving you here. Conceptually, it just seems like there's a natural shift, but it just the environment doesn't allow for it. <laughs> in the same well, it's way, super so. comfortable, right? I'm yes. used to walking into a physical classroom mm -hmm. and just talking for 50 minutes. Maybe it's lecture, maybe it's discussion, and we try to do that online and it just doesn't always work out that way. So we sort of need yeah. to rethink it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely, at my university, I recommended over and over, just, you know, try to try to think of a different way of doing it. And the report recorded, you know, has its own challenges too, but I mean, it's overall, you're not gonna run into these same sort of issues. You're not definitely not gonna get Zoom bombed on one of them, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Shut, up, Shut up, Justin. Shut up, Justin. Retard. Oh, I just did get George. George just let somebody in. Yeah, actually, I let Josh in a while ago. There's a whole group of people that are sitting here that are uh, waiting um, oh. in in the wait room. So I'm trying to. What I've been doing here is looking at what are the profiles of someone who's an idiot. Uh, one was Joe Mama. That was pretty easier. I, I expected oh. slightly better performance from Joe. 
uh, Josh was good, but then I had, right after Josh, there was a whole series of singles that were um, uh, also in that same position. So uh, yeah. They we, must have come in as a group. <laughs> They, they try to. Um, yeah. So I've got a few more here. So now I've gotten some of them to, they're not allowed to unmute themselves. So, and it's got to be sad. Like, let's say, you know, the dude that just showed up, you're here to have a big party and suddenly you're the only loser that shows up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you're expecting awesome things, but in the end it's like, no, you can't be in. So you're I'm trying you're to just crushing dreams every day, George, crushing dreams. See, now I'm trying to decide, do I let Laura in? I'm going to let Laura in. Oh, I've got seven, eight, ten in the waiting room now. Sam's here. Kyle's here. Huh. I'm going to just leave them there for a little bit. I'm, maybe I'll let Laura H in. Anyway, sorry, Justin, keep going. Even though Joe was quite rude to you, I want, I want to hear what you have to say. I think Negan was actually going to say something, building on what Justin was saying. All right, I was just sad. Or were you, or was I reading your nonverbals wrong? Oh. oh, Justin cannot unmute, nor can Negan. So you, oh. for some reason, locked everyone. I can now. You Thank you I. so much, George. Yeah, I'm not sure what you holder. Unmute. I thought I had unmuted you before. Let me just make you guys co-hosts so I can't take Oh, for some reason, I Negan's, know. oh, there she is. Her audio wasn't working. You just turned my video off for me. That's OK. Um, what I was, <laughs> all I wanted to say was just on the back of what Tanya was saying around synchronous, um, what I've also been hearing is how it's been challenging for uh, students um, and how some students just don't have the same sort of reliable internet at home um, or they're in quarantine and they can't get access to it and all sorts of things. Wow. Um, so just um, our teachers also now realizing it's not actually just the fact that the tool might fail, but it's also um the students might not be able to actually join into the zoom and um have told their teachers that they can't because for whatever internet reliability issue is usually the case and how they're upset they can't join into the discussion for example but they do continue on with the course with other means like as tanya was saying asynchronous ways of communicating with students but definitely just i think it's coming more to light now a bit of that unequal divide um around internet access again, more of a reason to explore the asynchronous, um, which is in a way kind of funny because when you think about online and distance education 15, 20 years ago, it was <laughs> asynchronous. It, we didn't have synchronous that often. It was really largely discussion forums and wikis and blogs and other forms of asynchronous activity. And um, we kind of have to go back to that when a lot of us were on dial-up and um, we had different ways of learning online that's all yeah that's all. and I think um you know at least the early ways uh and what I did is I wrote out my lectures and I had my powerpoints with my text at first along with you know articles and readings and that sort of thing and then slowly um then I tried uh, recording my lectures. This is 20 years ago. And then I really started to realize, wow, why would they want to listen to 50 minutes of me talking? Um, and luckily, you know, we started evolving as a field and we started to find out that there's so many different ways that we can deliver content. I definitely found out too, although I know lots of people like to record their lectures, it's asynchronous, it's lower risk. If you have a transcript, like you wrote out your lecture and you have the audio, that's great. Um, I spent a long time trying to be like exciting, um, recording into my computer, like, hey everyone. But I actually found the students didn't really care for the audio recordings that much. I mean, um, a talking PowerPoint at you for a long period of time is not effective way to communicate or to um, help students learn either. So although that might be what you're comfortable with and, and you should record it in smaller chunks, like 10 or 15 minutes, it can still, um, you know, the students and the research that I conducted and the data that I collected, they didn't um, want to listen to me talk for that amount of time either. They actually preferred the text so that they could just read it because it's faster to read, take notes and so forth. And so 
a little bit about where I went, then I got to cooler stuff like OER and so forth. I don't know if you guys have had some similar experiences with audio or um, recording lectures or any of those sorts of things. I didn't record it myself, but um, definitely in terms of the research that I've read and the research I've done as well as around video-based learning. Um, yeah, definitely they like the small chunks. I mean, a lot of that research is showing that, especially um, out of videos that are in MOOCs, et cetera. Um, but it's, yeah, it's that notion that I think academics think, as I think Justin was saying, it's easy, it's a mode change. Um, when really it's actually starting to think about what does online learning actually look like and it's actually quite different from face-to-face -face learning even though synchronously we might be face-to-face -face at times um and i think and i think george has been saying this over and over and over again over the past couple of weeks and that right now we're just trying to get over this initial hump and challenge um but hopefully in i don't know maybe four weeks six weeks we can hopefully dream we can start thinking about the next semester um you know whether that's july for people or september for people or whatever it may be that next semester where you actually can start and start thinking about that you know sooner rather than later how to actually be able to teach your students and i think like that realization tanya that you were saying that you did the online lectures then you started thinking about hey maybe this isn't the best way for my students to be learning I'm hoping many of our academics will have that same realization um, over the few, you know, the coming weeks once their anxiety levels uh, calm down a bit. And then we can actually start working with them in terms of, okay, what are different ways that you could design your online course and put material where it's easy for students to learn and what sort of um, mix of asynchronous and synchronous activities might you include? Um. I'm feeling yeah, sorry for I, our good friend, uh, Stephen here. He's trying he so hard. Yeah. Uh, I got to remove he, him. He even had his content ready to share. Actually, not really. He tried for a long time. Like he was here for a good 10 minutes listening to this engaging chat. So I wonder what's the value if you're like a Zoom bomber and you literally spend 10 minutes of your day in order to finally figure out the only thing left to do is type text in a chat box. Well, maybe kind of anyway. Again, I say they say that kids have no persistence. I believe that they do. It just has to be for a uh, different motivation. Yeah, I think I had to figure that, you know, that journey out for myself. And it was different for each of my courses, depending on uh, what my, and I wasn't even thinking about learning objectives back then, honestly. Like the department had come up with some learning objectives for the courses. Um, I actually um, taught my first online course when I was a doctorate student. And so you just sort of do what's been done to you and you never really thought about it differently. Um, and it's funny, I was thinking today, because the reason I ended up in the communication field, I originally um, actually majored in psychology but I actually thought their teaching was not great. It wasn't engaging. And I ended up accidentally ending up in some communication, human communication courses and was like, oh, these people teach so much better. You know, it's active and it's group learning and, um, you know, all of these other fun things. So, but it's, you know, it was a journey that I sort of had to go through. And before I even started thinking about backwards design and learning objectives it's online, it sort of was like, content, more digital content. Woo, look at all these fun activities I can do. And I was tacking it on and we've actually published about it. We call it the course and a half syndrome because you're worried about rigor and then you find cool stuff. And then next, you know, I was like not sleeping two nights because I had to stay up all night grading all of this. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This is like, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this course. And I was like, I really need to streamline this so I could sleep this semester. And I'm thinking if I'm not sleeping, my students are probably doing a ton. And that's where I found backwards design and um, was thinking like, all right, let's just hold here. What do I want my students to do at the end of the semester? And it wasn't about like, whoo, there's 16 chapters in the book. There's 16 topic areas. I should have 16 lectures um, supplementing the textbook or, you know, so for me, it was a, a journey and I failed. And so I share my failures 
um, and helping others and like, oh, I know you think you want to go there, but probably not. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great to, uh, I think the, the experience in particular, I just want to go right back to an earlier point. And, you know, Matt, I, I think if you want to dive in at this point as well, uh, I think the first thing you started chatting about, uh, Tanya, as well, it, which sort of underpins much of this for me, which is we, it, replacing your one-hour lecture with a one-hour Zoom session is not the way to go. Uh, the difficulty is to there's a higher threshold of skill sets needed if you're going to move to sort of asynchronous learning because you need to learn a different set of approaches to engage with other students, engage with each other, and so on. So the synchronous, asynchronous connection is not an easy one to manage properly because you for fall, I think we'll see a lot more problem-based learning, group-based courses coming up. For right now, the easiest thing to do is to just take what you've done and make it lecturable. But uh, Matt, I don't think we've heard from you yet. How are you doing? Still recovering from the uh, Zoom bomber. That was, uh, that was something else. No. <laughs> um, I, I felt like this week I've kind of come full circle in my career as an instructional designer because when I first got into it, we're, we had a bunch of faculty bringing in stacks of DVDs, trying to figure out how to get these DVDs online. And then it comes around this week that I have faculty asked me how to get DVDs online. So um, it's, it's kind of come around full circle. Um, and in some ways this week, you know, in the time period we're in, I, I get where they're at. They need some content quickly and they have this old DVD that's a lot better than them talking over Zoom. So they're just wanting to figure out how to get pieces of it off the DVD. And I understand that. Um, but um, yeah, I totally lost my train of thought where I was going with that, but that's what I've noticed <laughs> happening. Uh, the other thing I've seen uh, is that, um, um, I just, I'm just reading so many really, really horrendously bad stories of how online proctoring is going, uh, especially the proctoring services. I mean, it's just people are having to throw up on camera because they are afraid of failing and they are having, they're told they can't go take their medicine, even though they're starting to have some kind of asthma attack or something. I mean, it's just, it's just you know and it's all that same thing of we're this is what we're used to this is what we're going to do online but we've got to rethink it in better ways because there's just it's, you know every time they come up with some way to lock down the browser students find a way around it and they try to lock that down then they find a way around it and they try to lock that down and it just becomes this never-ending cycle of chasing after cheating and um and it's, it's, it's all back to that same idea of there are better ways to do this online. And that's what we try to convince people to do. I, I uh, shared in a blog post some of our chapters from the, the textbook, it's not the textbook, but the OER book we had put out last year about how we had talked about some different alternatives to the assessment as well. So hopefully we can get people thinking through that. Um, definitely this week is uh, not only the, the coronavirus news getting worse and worse but also seeing the stories from students getting a, a bit more or a lot more concerning and depressing as as they are feeling the the crunch of us going online too fast Um, Justin, what about you? You've had a similar early experience to Matt uh, because this week is a content creation week and uh, you might recall the joys of DVDs and the transition, but I want to pick up both on the DVD transition, but secondly, on the proctoring issue because wow, uh, you know, assessment online, it, it bringing the full attitude of in-campus mindsets when you're doing things online, that's just it's just not functional. Something significant. Oh, you guys, why do you guys get, I'm going to unmute you. I'm, I thought I've given everybody co-host privilege. See, this is the problem. I want to emphasize this. We mute ourselves, like in between people, we can't come back on. So I think uh, like Megan, Matt, Justin, and I just need to keep our mics on maybe. I think I've given you guys uh host privileges so with host privileges or co-host privileges you should be able to do it but this is something i don't I'm, have host privileges i blessed you with host privileges you are now well then you <laughs> took them away 
Wow. Yeah, are you calling me a liar, George? I, yeah, no, I actually think he did take them away because I see it pop up on my screen that Tanya got co-host and then I still gone. don't have. Oh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong. Oh, I'm not on speak. No, I don't know. All right. Try mute and unmute again. See if see if you oh, have the power. Go. Yeah. No. Wait, um, oh, now I do. I have it back. All right. <laughs> Thanks, George. That's helpful. So, so going back to that, um, yes, I've had a number of people ask me about it as well. But um, you know, I think it's even like with the um, with the one of those sub uh, sections that we have in, in week two here about like sort of the closed versus open technologies. Um, that's something I've definitely seen. There, people see that there there can be some great benefits to using some of these really tight closed systems and the uniformity, people being used to things and things like that, and some of the challenges of using some more open things, especially in the short term. So I think that's the part of it is like, in the short term, everybody wants to just sort of recreate exactly, like, again, what we were saying earlier, like what we already have, you know, we've had a safe, you know, secure room and, you know, quote unquote, for for testing, you know, we have TAs walking around and we take a blue book test or whatever. So I think that's, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's just sort of that mindset um, of that where, you know, maybe if we have a little bit more time, we're not panicking, we can start to see that there are other possibilities and, and I definitely hope that this is something that this course is going to um, help people sort of at least think about and chew over. And it doesn't mean you have to do all of it, but maybe try some things, you know, going forward too. I mean, as, as we see with what, what Tanya said, I mean, a lot of it's just experimenting. And it's the same thing, you know, with, with iPad too. I mean, it's been years and years. I mean, I've taught online for, like, yeah, since 2008. And, um, you know, it's it's a lot of the stuff that's just been, holy cow, that didn't work. And then being reflective and thinking why it didn't work. Too. And then not being afraid, as I think I mentioned this last week too, of, of man, this isn't working, eject, let's try something new. And then being, you know, very transparent with your students and saying, hey, we're trying this, this is what's going to happen, it's not going to negatively impact you. And now we're going to try something else, you know, and do this going forward. And having, you know, just be thinking about a plan B, um, whether it's, you know, secret session failing, you know, now, hey, maybe let's do this reading instead or something. Um, so I think, I think that's just the, uh, that's a, that's a big issue. And like I said, with, the, with that article that I posted to on the digital divide, I mean, it is just a continuous thing that we have to, we have to remember, especially as we live in Texas and, um, right, and, and like one third of, you know, our population doesn't have full broadband access, broadband access. So thinking about the kinds of um, technologies that we want to use, I mean, that's, that, that's hard. And, and, and being able to have a system that's going to connect and dial in all the time. I mean, you're thinking about if you're using something like Respondus, and you don't have a stable enough connection that it can continuously yeah. monitor you with your webcam or things like that. I mean, that's such a huge challenge. Not to mention, I mean, there's, there's varying degrees of quality of webcams and what it can see and can't see. And I mean, it's, it, it's hard. I mean, I understand why people want to, you know, maintain the integrity, um, you know, the academic integrity of, of the course, you know, but at the same time, you know, there are five weeks left. You know, we've already done a lot of good stuff too, you know, and how, what can we do going forward? Um, I think is, is, is sort of the bigger question now. It is, we were just trying to survive, you know, and we don't want to have a bunch of cheating. We don't want to give a bunch of, you know, passing grades to people that quote unquote don't deserve. And I understand that that sort of mindset and we want to be respectful of that. But at the same time, you know, I think part of it is just um, being open to other alternatives and other ways of being able to do things. And I think Matt, you know, has talked you know, a lot about that with the evaluation work last, um, the, whatever the talk we did on in week zero and some other things. I, I, you know, I, I think that's good enough. I'll leave it there unless other people chime in. I think what you said, Justin, is important. And I don't know if everyone in, um, in the edX course understands that you can change things. So I think um, the first thing is giving yourself permission to desert your original syllabus and assessment plan because that's what we have to do when you are forced to uh, pivot online and remote teach in the middle of the semester. So I think it's really important for faculty and instructors to give themselves permission to make changes to what your original plan was. As long as your students are accomplishing learning objectives, in the course, and it might be through different means and activities than previously, and they're able to demonstrate that they learned, that's really what's important, whether it's through an exam or through um, another means. But I think a lot of people need to be like, it's okay to make a change. Give yourself permission to make changes to your original syllabus. And I know, um, you know, when I was at Arizona State, it was like you, they treated the syllabus as like, this is your contract, um, you have to be concerned about um, the liabilities of that, but 
hey, this is uh, this is pivoting and we're dealing with a pandemic and very different times and it's okay to make a change. Tanya is giving you permission. Give yourself permission. Make I a think change. a lot of institutions are trying to provide avenues for instructors to do that as well. Um, you know, in terms of, okay, is it a change in assessment type? Is it a change in assessment mode? Is it, you know, um, just changing it so instead of it being a face-to-face -face, um, assessment, it's turned into online. Um, you know, maybe they can record themselves doing whatever it was that they were going to do face-to-face -face and submit that. Or in some times it is an actual type change, like it's no longer an exam, but now it's maybe a report or something like that. Um, I think it's just, just important though that the instructors communicate that really clearly to the students. Because I mean, you're right, Tanya, a lot of places do treat that syllabus as a contract with the student. Um, so changes midway when students are already very um, anxious. And certainly if the course has exams, I think the students are even more anxious right now because they don't know, is it happening, is it not? Is it being proctored or not? Or what the plans are? Similarly, the instructors, so I think it's, um, making those changes you know with approval of your head of school and whatever else but also making it really really clear to the students what those changes are um as early as possible i suppose um but because it is still that sort of contract so one thing i wanted to just pick up on was i was looking at that open and closed forum and i think justin touched on it a bit as well there are a few um interesting or good comments that came through from the students in edx um so i think sarah and um Someone by the name of Dr. Peters and Fernande, they were um, all saying similar in terms of, you know, right now when there is that bit of anxiety, um, have, relying on the closed systems in a way is nice because likely they're being used across a number of courses and students are familiar with them um, or the instructors are familiar with them and there's um, less, you know, new tools being added on, less diversity um, might be better at this particular time. Um, but also, I think it was um, Fernande that raised a point that the open technologies are sometimes useful because that's, those are the technologies the students are going to use when they graduate um, and when they move on from, from their institution. So they might be using social media when they graduate. So you might want to bring that into the learning experience now. Um, so yeah, I think absolutely it's important to consider the safety net of the closed technologies and both in terms of students are used to it, the tech support is readily there, that sort of thing that there's not a lot of, you know, privacy or data issues. And then also thinking about, well, what other online tools um, lend themselves well. Um, and it's probably, again, thinking more about that next semester, that next term, um, when this um, pivot to online is still kind of happening what sort of other tools can be brought in slowly and I think the point really is also I mean I know from a lot of the research I've done is that just throwing in a technology in one course doesn't have the same effect that if it's through an entire program or a couple of courses in a program so maybe talking to colleagues who teach courses in the same degree or program as you to say you know I'm thinking of using WordPress for my students to use a blog because the blog in our LMS is not really good what do you think, you know, maybe they'll use it in a couple courses um, and that way it's, even though it's an open technology, it's not necessarily a closed institutionally supported one. It's being used across a number of courses. So students get introduced to it in the first course. They start to slowly um, understand the value of it, move on to the next course. They're now familiar with it. They're more likely to take it up and use it. And there's a bit of research that kind of shows how that programmatic approach to technology can be helpful for student uptake and then therefore student learning. Um, but that, yeah, that was all. Yeah, the blogging makes me think of a lot about um, recently, because I know lots of folks in the sciences are looking for different um, things to do. They're very new to online. And I know um, several folks that are in this course. And you know, I've been reading um, Trevor Bedford's uh, reports that he's been blogging and microblogging on Twitter about the coronavirus. He's a biologist out of Seattle, and it's um, got me thinking um, to, I wrote a book on social media, and it wasn't about social media per se, it was really about learning and communicating, but how you could use social media tools, and some of that was shared in this week. 
But you know, um, some social media tools like blogs and micro blogs can be used not only to deliver content, but they're a great way to create an opportunity for students to um, build digital literacy skills and include them as part of the assessment. So you can um, use Twitter or microblogging, you can even use um, video sharing tools like YouTube in order to go out and curate resources about um, biology, about chemistry as it relates to the coronavirus or different things that are out there. You can curate links to those and bring them into your course, but you can also, instead of let's say using a quiz or exam, have students produce things that can be shared on Twitter or shared on micro, uh, which is a micro blog or shared on a blog like WordPress or other sorts of things. And, you know, also we see from the um, career data that we're seeing that students don't know how to communicate via technology um, or to work as teams on technology. And so when we talk about science communication, dissemination through microblogging or blogging, it's a new way to think about assessing your students while also building um, digital literacy. So as you talked about that, Neg and I was thinking about, wow, there's all these examples that we're seeing this, um, this communication about science being done in social media tools and blogs, microblogs, video um, sharing. And it, it's just a great opportunity rather than seeing it as like, wow, what do I do? It's like, oh my gosh, there's all these great examples out there that I can bring into my classroom that I've never thought about before. So I think for, um, for some people, there might be that aha moment. So if you're a scientist and you're reading up about the coronavirus and stumbling on examples, um, there was a chemist too on Twitter that I had shared out that she was, um, you know, using hierarchical tweets to share out um, lessons and there's just so many great scientists using um, Twitter and blogs that you could just bring in as lessons uh, you know especially if you're looking at um, a team-based project um, to incorporate maybe instead of you know the 32 lectures that you had or 16 lectures or different things like that. See, and I, and I think the, the the topics here because we are looking at the content component this week and there's a few things that are, are, I think, quite relevant uh, that faculty, profs, staff should be aware of, which is the, the emotional climate of their student population. And part of our responsibility, I love the example that you mentioned, Tanya, with the, the blogger slash micro blogger, uh, you know, in virology and, and uh, you know, epidemiologists and others is if you're teaching a course on, I don't know, pick a topic, uh, are there ways that you can take advantage of the public conversation going on around this? Because we're trying to make sense of it. Let's say you're teaching, you know, cognitive processes, uh, you know, in psychology, hypothetically. Uh, there's ways that you can add layers that relate to what's happening currently. How are we making sense of this? If it's a sociology course, what are the social implications of these dynamics? Like, it, it's, a, I think, one of the really hard things for faculty to recognize when they move online is that you don't have to create everything. You, you have to begin to engage in a broader conversation that's happening already online, tap your students into that, and then provide some, for lack of a better word, meta support, uh, guiding them through what's factual and what's not, how to recognize useful things and what's not useful, uh, using open education resources so that you don't have to create anything yourself and the list goes on. So I think that's such a, it's a big factor for people to think about is that you don't need to put everything that you are doing in your courses directly onto a, a platform when you go online. It's about engaging at least at a twofold level, using open education resources and giving them access to the broader public conversation and making that meaning making part of your course experience. I think um, OER is new probably for lots of people um, that are a part of the edX course. I know coming from a face-to-face -face classroom, you hear about OER, we use lots of acronyms, I feel like, um, but maybe we should share a little bit more about what is OER and why it can be so useful for folks. I know there was some stuff shared as part of the course this week, but I don't know if somebody wants to talk about that. Uh, well, any right, takers? Probably about. Justin, Matt. <laughs> I know Matt just did a, you know, we had a couple of videos of discussions I had with uh, David Wiley this week around OERs. Yep. 
Um, but Matt, I know you just finished an, an open education text. Uh, anybody want to tackle this question? What are OERs and why should faculty or profs or staff care? Yeah, we, um, I was, you know, thinking about how we're talking about uh, creating content and I created that blog post a couple of weeks ago about uh, a quick way to put together a week's content in an hour. And, you know, my suggestion had been to just search for, uh, do 15, 20 minutes, search for resources, curate a list, put it out there, and then move on. And there's pushback against that. People were telling me, I even shared a comment with Justin, uh, this one uh, professor that said, but I'm the expert. It's a lot quicker for me to just talk from my expertise and we find this other stuff. And I was like, I've tried it before. It takes a long time to create content. It takes me hours to create a blog post sometimes just because I'm wrestling over all the different details and stuff, right? Uh, but I'm like, you know, good luck if you're going to go that route. But as far as finding that content out there, the open educational resources is, um, uh, I found is a, a very good place to start your searches. Uh, a lot of people will automatically want to go to Google or, you know, Bing or whatever they, they use. But, you know, you basically have this entire community that has been creating resources that, uh, in all types of topics, no matter what you teach, there's probably topics there. And you're usually given the permission to reuse it, to download it, and remix it as you want. So, like, the book that we created that we've shared in this class, um, the Creating Online Learning Experiences, you can go online, you can take that, you can use it as is, you can just point to different chapters if you want to, or you can download it and import it or into your own site or download uh, something else, um, you know, into WordPress or whatever, and then start remixing as you want to, and that's, that's legal, that's part of the permission. And a lot of the work of creating the content has been done for you right there, and it's a huge time saver as well. Because instead of having to create all this content, now you've got it there for you to remix as you would like your students to read it. Or maybe add your own thoughts in there. Or, you know, like with our book, we, we put the Hypothesis uh, as a tool that allows you to comment directly on the web page and see you put comments there and say, uh, you know, I totally disagree with Matt here. He's totally off base here. He has no idea what he's talking about. Blah, 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 whatever you want to into it, you know. And so there, there are lots of different options to do that as well. And I think that, um, engaging with even opinions that you don't agree with or uh, not necessarily opinions, but you know, different, uh, different scholarly schools of thought uh, that you may not fully uh, uh, subscribe to yourself. You know, say there are different scientific theories that you, you subscribe to one versus the other. Uh, it's a great way to get students to think critically about those theories or ideas and you don't necessarily have to control everything that they read in, in, in what you're putting in that content there. It's okay for them to be exposed to stuff that maybe uh, your competing professor at the other university has or whatnot. So I think Justin had one to share something too. Yeah, so um, for me, and it's it, great. I mean, absolutely, definitely go and find resources for sure. And then something else that just something to chew on, maybe not for the next six weeks, but going forward and thinking about if we're going to move online more and more is, you know, creating your own OERs. And I know we had some resources that Negan shared on, on that. Um, one thing that I think like David Wiley would, would definitely talk about a lot would, is like student code creation that I know, um, there are great opportunities to leverage the expertise and, and just the time and, and, and have more value for an assignment rather than having a disposable assignment where you come in, you check that box, do what you need to do and you move on to the next thing. Um, can we start to curate and create items with our students? Um, so for an example that I can have uh, for work I'm doing at ETA with our, um, with our quality enhancement plan for accreditation is we created a student, uh, a student teamwork guide. So we identified that there's a gap around how to do effective teamwork in our classroom. So that's one of the things that we're, we're working on as a project. And um, one of the things that we're doing is creating, a, uh, we've created a guide and it's in pilot stage right now and it's an OER and anybody can use it. And we created very modular um, to where you take what you need. So if you're you know, teaching a class and you need to do X, then you pull that part out and use that. If you wanna go from front to back, great, you do that too. Um, but one of the things that we're also doing is we're working with uh, like peer academic leaders. Um, so these are students that are teaching incoming either um, transfer students or first year students and, um, and sharing 
you know, some of these effective practices with them and help guiding them through lessons. So that's one of the things we're doing is we're working with them to curate what some of their lessons are and have them contribute and things that they can share with others on campus, especially if it's domain specific practices. Um, so we have you know, people that do this specifically for engineering or, or other things that perhaps, I mean, I don't have the expertise on maybe some of the ways that you could use that in that context, but you could work with faculty and students in that context to be able to go and co-develop things. I just think that that's um, you know, a great way to, to involve you know, students in part of the process and it creates more value for it. And honestly, it's something they can put on their resume when they leave the university as well. Yeah, I, and two for people that are new, like curating is you're just going out and finding stuff. You're getting links or you're getting PDFs or videos, or uh, maybe it's like a wrapped up animation and a zip. So curating is like a fancy word in the OER community, like going out, getting stuff, selecting it, identifying, reviewing it, and, and putting it together in a way that's meaningful for your students, just for folks that are new. Um, I always am just reminded, especially sometimes I have researchers that come on that are not from education and they're like, what are you talking about here? So. Um, you know, OER is open education resources and it's stuff that's usually free or open or anybody can sort of get their hands on um, to some degree. And when I first started doing OER, I didn't know I was using it. Um, and so I, you know, there's certain things that you teach sometimes that there isn't a book on. And so a lot of times it's, you can get an article you can share with your students under copyright laws. Um, so I would go out and get media articles as well as peer reviewed articles and share those with my students. I also, being a low income um, first generation college student, know how hard it is to pay for textbooks. And I really didn't want my students to have to pay a ton of money for textbooks. So more and more I found myself curating just chapters from, art, uh, from different peer reviewed things or even like a chapter from a book. If you're under 15%, it's um, good for copyright. You can share it. So sometimes some of us might be using OER already or using copyrighted materials, but within a framework that's, um, that's legal. And so we might not even know it. Maybe you're already using links to certain articles um, that are like from the mass media or from peer reviewed articles or chapters of books and you're curating different sources and putting them together. So I didn't even know I was doing that or using OER, you know, 20 years ago, I just knew communication technology, there's not a lot of published textbooks that can stay up to date as communication technology, which is one of the courses I do changes. I think also what we forget is that OER um, is free, but it's better. So yes, I can produce some things by myself, but some of the video labs that are already out there are far better than I can produce by myself, getting back to what George was saying about the skills. I might be able to give a lecture about structuration theory about Anthony Giddens, but Anthony Giddens is on YouTube talking about structuration theory. I mean, that's better than reading about it, nor me telling you what I think structuration theory is about from the Constitution of Society. So, um, you know, there's videos out there of labs that are much better than we can produce. There's actually people who are the source, like the scholar or the author who um, wrote about this that are out there. And so I think sometimes um, the quality and the information is going to be better than what we can go out and get than what we could produce by ourselves. So for me, there was the, you know, um, there wasn't a textbook or, you know, I had to go out and find things and I didn't even know I was using OER. And then two, it's just sometimes OER is much better than we can produce by ourselves. So, but I love the idea that Justin talks about co-creation. That was one that took me a little while to get to. Like, should I really have my students out there identifying information? Wait, my students and I are working together to put something, you know, it just was a little bit out of my frame of reference of, you know, what I had learned in grad school. Nobody in, when I was in grad school or even undergrad was trying to co-create anything with me. That's not how it works. That's not the expert model. And now I'm like, oh yeah, because that's really how life works, right? And our professions were like this, this right here is an example of us all coming together and co-creating. And so we have to move out of that sort of expert paradigm into one where we are collaborating and sharing and that's just the way things work. But it's a little uncomfortable, but um, I definitely, um, you know, love the idea of it and in practice it actually works too. <laughs> 
And speaking of uh, collaborating and sharing, I was going to say real quick, the OER 20 conference is going on right now yes, online. It is. So there's the hashtag, the hashtag is OER 20. Two zero, yeah, o o yeah. OER two zero. So if you want to follow that and see what the, some of the conversations are, I know people are putting their slides up and, and sharing some so things that they're doing. So for people who are new to Twitter um, are using hashtags, if you go to twitter.com and in the search bar, you put the pound sign or hex OER 20, you will see all of the conversations and resources being shared on Twitter um, by different folks who either uh, attending it virtually or just taking part of the conversations that are happening. So if you've always wanted to check out Twitter, which is, uh, I guess, a microblogging tool is what they classify it as, um, having a hashtag or this sort of um, tag uh, to put into the search bar in Twitter is a great way to jump in. It's better than going to Twitter and just like talking to yourself and not understanding how it works. So I think a hashtag is a good place to start. And there's tons of awesome resources. And you can actually um, choose to participate in OER 20 if you want to. I think it's still open, isn't it? guys? I think through tomorrow, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's a great place. And I think it's in its 17th, what year is this? I feel like it's been a while. 17th year, am I making that up? 10th year, 11th year? Maybe. Oh, and, and Negan put it in the chat. Oh, and Justin put in the URL too. All right, so any, uh, so we've talked OERs, we've talked content creation, we briefly got on to the proctoring one. Um, I don't know if we quite nailed that one fully other than to say the proctoring aspect sucks. It's not being done well. It's a pedagogical problem at its base. Is testing that way the best way to assess students' knowledge is probably the bigger question we're targeting. Um, but that's not something many of you are going to be able to address right now. You may not have time design wise to make that shift. But as uh, I think my view is this is not a short term problem. We're dealing with months and years, not weeks and months. And that means uh, you should be slowly turning your attention to what is your September going to look like and how are you going to manage it at that point. Any other final thoughts related to content creation that we should be chatting about? Not about content creation, but George, I think you raise an important point. I know a lot of people, um, faculty and instructors and administrators and community organizations um, are still sort of processing what this is gonna look like when the new term starts. And in all honesty, I know I would prepare to be fully online. Um, come the last week in August, first week of September, which is usually around when we go live, uh, just because of the current state of things, it's um, best to plan for that. And so um, I think, you know, when George alludes to like, or we say comments like, and when you're preparing for the fall, <laughs> like, um, yeah, better be safe than sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where you're going to have a little bit of time to actually design properly, to actually think about the relationship between outcomes, teaching, learning practices, and subsequent assessment. And that's when you can move away from things that require, like we'll call it pedagogies of distrust, which means I have to, I have to control how I assess you because I don't trust that you're going to be honest, right? So I have to lock down your browser to test your knowledge. I think there's a range of ways that we can do things in a more structured way that aren't based on that sort of core premise of I don't trust you. And, and that's really the goal come fall semester or September. I know some of you that would be summer if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, but that's the semester where you may have a window to do that. But I had somebody on Twitter that also raised, you know, a lot of people who are working contracts, it's like, what is the expectation? They're going to do this in their spare unpaid time over summer while they're waiting for the next semester to begin. There's some social and, and other dynamics that are at play as well. Final thoughts as we wrap up. I think the only thing I would add is um, on the content creation front is it could, regardless of whether you're creating your own content or you're curating content from what's already out there through the OERs, it can be time consuming. Um, but often what happens is that you put in a lot of time up front for future gain. So when you're actually then delivering the course, um, 
it could use less of your time. So it, it kind of goes back to that whole teaching presence um, that we talked about a few weeks ago where you're putting out that your teaching presence is the creation of your content or the creation of content. Um, either way, it can take up a lot of time, whether it's over your summer or just right now as you're designing your courses. But once you actually start delivering it, and that's part of the beauty of online is that while up front there's a lot of your investment in time, when you're actually delivering it, that's where you your focus is more than on that facilitation, the checking in on communication, the assessments, um, and kind of that guide as students are learning. You're not necessarily then creating content and looking for content endlessly. So I think it's just that notion that there's a lot of time put in it up front um, for future gain. That's it. I'm just going to quick say, um, check out your institution's resources for the summer. I know that some institutions and um, some organizations like the Online Learning Consortium and Educause and Quality Matters and some tech companies are offering, you know, um, professional development, faculty development sorts of opportunities so that you can learn um, some of these in, in more detail. And, um, you know, I know my institution offers a faculty development program in the summer twice um, to help folks um, start redesigning their courses and so forth. And so there's other resources that will be out there that are available to you um, beyond this course that you can tap into as well. All right, well, on that note, thanks everybody. I hope you uh, have a good rest of the week and we'll uh, connect with you uh, next week, Wednesday. Take care.